Hello and welcome to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton, and welcome back to the Toffee Blues podcast. It's been a, it's been a bit of a busy week, uh, Everton wise, I'd say. Uh, you know, as we say, it's never really a, a quiet week uh, for um, supporting this club. But uh, yeah, like I said, there's plenty to get through. So I guess uh, jumping straight in, I, I, I almost, I know you shouldn't really say this on a podcast, really, but I kind of almost want to get this one out of the way, really. But uh, yeah, so um, Tottenham on a Saturday, of course, uh, didn't quite go as we uh, as we would have liked. Um, I'd say I don't think optimism was. It's, it's to be fair, going into the game, it's probably about as low as I can remember it being for a while. Uh, to be fair, so um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess I guess where do we start with a, a game like that, really? Yeah, I mean. Dice has talked about it for so long, how it's all about changing the story, but I think all Everton fans knew what the story was going to be on Saturday against Tottenham. Um, it was a struggle. We got battered in the end. And there's no real surprises there because the team were, you know, lacking in confidence, you should say. Start the season, lacking fitness. Just didn't really have an idea of how we were going to break them down or, you know, defend against them. And we got what we deserved, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Like I say, um, I guess the biggest surprise really it was uh, obviously there was a lot of um talk about this uh, going into the game, um the the idea of of who was going to play right back. I think we both said that we couldn't really see a world in which uh Deitch would actually start Dixon, and uh, yeah, that is exactly what um what happened. So uh, yeah, um, I guess what was what was your reaction to that really when when that was announced, and uh, and what did you make of his performance? Yeah, well, I, I was pleased he was playing because I think, you know, who, who was he going to play? Holgate, who doesn't really have a future. Um, I thought he had a solid game. I thought he came out of it quite, quite well, relatively unscathed in terms of it could have been an awful game for him playing against Son or whoever it was. You know, he could have been, like, torn to pieces. But I thought he, he did well. He played against Odebert, didn't he? So it was quite a good matchup, wasn't it? Because he's quite young himself. So that probably made put a, put a pressure put a bit of pressure off him. But I thought he played really well. I thought he was solid. You know, he's got a bit of pace about him as well. I think he's like the fastest at the club. Mm. So, yeah, I was pleased with his performance. And, you know, I think he could would have come out of it with, you know, his confidence quite high and pleased, pleased with himself. Yeah, that's like I say, you can, you, can, you can tell he's definitely still very raw. I don't think, you know, I think it would have been surprising if he didn't really appear like that. And, you know, I think, you know, there was a lot of stats going before that it was very surprising that he started. I think, you know, it's very rare for... A player who has literally not had a single minute of senior football, like he hasn't been on loan anywhere, or you know played any like league cup games or anything like that, or or anything of that nature, and yet suddenly starting a, a Premier League fixture. Um, and I say I I think he um I think it pretty much went as well as it could have done. Really, it could have been an absolute disaster, as you say, and you know Son could have rinsed him, and you know I say obviously Son ends up getting two goals or whatever, and it's, you know it's it's not the most. Uh, you know, great of debuts. You know, you don't really want to, as a defender, make your debut in a four 0 defeat. But um, as people pointed out, you know, uh, Coleman's first ever game, five 0 thrashing at Benfica all those years ago. So, who knows? It might be, you know, a very uh, like the start of of some sort of journey. You know, like of of an incredible journey. Um, but obviously, you know, that's getting very ahead of ourselves there, of course. But yeah, like I say, it was. It, it it was shocking, wasn't it, Tottenham? Really, um, about as bad as as most people were anticipating. Um, I I I kind of thought that you know I thought we'd struggle defensively, obviously with with numbers missing. Obviously, Tarkovsky being deemed fit was a bit of a boost in in a, in a way. Um, but I still thought we'd have I thought we'd create a bit more than we did, and you know, and pose them more problems than we did. And I think that was the main point of concern for me because you know, like as as I mentioned, when we play Tottenham. They they're usually quite open and those opportunities usually are there, but I can't really remember any times where I really thought we we should have scored. Um, well, and yeah, that was definitely a bit of a concern for me. I thought, yeah, well, we exploited those spaces, didn't we, last season? Um, because we played quite well, but in the in the game on Saturday, we just we just couldn't create anything, could we? We couldn't keep the ball for a start. Um, but yeah, I I mean, as going back to Dixon, I, I think. Um, he, 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 had a, he had a good game. I, I, I was happy with his performance. And, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, obviously, as I say, it all kind of, um, as I say, it all kind of spiralled and the, and the bad feeling kind of continued because um, because of the footage that obviously um, got released on social media, I think, a couple of days after, maybe, of um, of the players getting back onto the train at Euston and, 
uh, the fans behind the barrier, not exactly giving them the uh, the warmest of send offs. Um, and that, as I say, we we were all you know gutted and you know angry and all sorts. And after that game, but you you know there, there's got to be a line there, hasn't there? I think. And and I, I was I was pleased to see that pretty much everyone I saw on social media was was condemning it and you know calling calling them out for what they were and 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 uh and you know saying that, that that's that's just not the right way to go about expressing that that disappointment uh i i imagine you're of, of the same thinking well yeah i mean for a start of course there are these fans that are travel like most of us do all you know not everyone goes to ways because they don't get the opportunity or whatever reason they don't go they they're more than entitled to have their opinion on the players because the performance wasn't good enough. It's true they're right, but there's a way of expressing those feelings, isn't there? I mean, at the end of the day, these people are humans. I'm not going to play better by just like screaming, and shouting, and giving handing a lot of abuse to them. Maybe they do need to hear it, but there's a different way of like expressing those feelings, as as you've just mentioned. Um, yeah, I didn't didn't agree with the way they went about it. It's it's hard, isn't it? Because they are spending all their money like. And to be served up that going down to London and then having to travel back, it's frustrating and it angers you. But you know, you look at the looking at the bigger pictures, these are human beings and nobody's not made a mistake in work before. Mm. Or you know, whatever way you pull it. So yeah, it's not gonna help the team in the long run. I mean, but on on the flip side of things, you can argue that the professional footballers they're paid enough to be able to deal with these sort of things. But yeah, I don't agree with shouting out with beats like that. Mm, yeah, but I say I think obviously I I mean you could you could say it's because of, like the reactions or whatever, but I think it was it was it was telling to me that it seemed to be Mope and Holgate getting the main brunt of of it all and getting you know the, the their wages shouted at them and things like that when when neither of them were even involved at Tottenham, which which says to me that it's it's it, it was a bit more it was more targeted rather than just frustration that 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 that, that latest performance. Um, and and yeah, that 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 for me, as 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 we've just said, is 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 never really right. Um, and yeah. obviously, it's 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 similar to the feeling of last season. I think I remember um, there's there's quite similar parallels in that after we got um beat by Villa, um, I think I can't remember if Calvert-Lewin released something publicly about the treatment he'd received at Villa Park when he'd gone off with that head injury. Um and then some fans had actually booed him going off as if as if that was somehow his fault and you know again built out frustration at how how much he'd been absent around then and how many important games he'd missed for injury and just and just born out of frustration but again booing's never right I I really don't think you should ever I can't think of a situation where you'd ever really boo your own players um and and that be seen as a positive thing really and. Yeah, I think it, it it contributed into a bit of a negative feeling. I felt going into the Doncaster game, um, I felt that was quite flat, and I think it probably maybe contributed a little bit to the atmosphere being flat for so long in the game. Um, but yeah, I guess you know, moving on to the Doncaster game, really, uh, the team that Deitch put out. What 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 did you think of that? Was we surprised by just how many? I I guess you know, just how strong we went, really. I guess. Um, I, I wasn't surprised at all with how strong or, you know, even including the new additions because we needed the win and we needed a bit of positivity around the team. You know, they need fitness, they need confidence. You know, that takes us into the weekend now on the back of a win rather than, you know, you know scraping through 1-0 or, you know, struggling against like a League 2 side, whatever. So it was good to see Lindstrom getting the side. You know, he's still getting his fitness and you know, like acclimatising. Jake O'Brien wasn't really tested, but he was solid. And then you got Illiman and Dai, who I thought was, you know, the start, uh, the standout player. Really, he had a bit of flair, got uh, the fans off the seats. So yes, yeah, so that, that's the positive, isn't it? You, I think you got to have them die in for the for the weekend as well. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree. And that I say, I think, you know, the, the first half maybe wasn't quite as you know as dominant as we would have hoped, and you know. And I, I guess you can say, you know, there's a lot of players, you know, playing together for the first time and, you know, it's 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 all kind of, you know, gelling and things like that. But I thought in the second half, we started to see a lot more, you know, really nice link-up play. And, and obviously, you know, it, you can't really judge, judge, judge it too much against, you know, with the, with the team being, with the opposition being so much weaker than, you know, the type of teams you get in the Premier League. And obviously there was a bit more, like, playing out from the back because because Doncaster weren't coming on to us as much as as much as Premier League teams will, which obviously like I say, so you won't be afforded that. 
um, come the weekend. But it's 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 all encouraging signs to me, particularly in the second half. And as you say, um, in Dai showed some really nice touches, scores a great goal. Ira Boonham again was just outstanding. Um, uh, like what just won everything in the midfield really, and some really nice touches. And very unlucky not to get a goal, of course, which uh, ultimately went down to Dwight McNeil just for uh, getting in the way. And and I thought I was really nice to see Beto get on the score sheet as well. I think you know. I think he's a player that it's it's impossible not to like, really. You know, sometimes his performance levels aren't quite as high as we'd like them to be, but you can tell just how much he cares and, and, and how much he wants to score. And you could tell that by his celebration, you know, a, a pretty meaningless goal in a pretty meaningless game, really. And yet you could tell it still meant the world to him, really. And hopefully now he'll, he'll be able to kick on a little bit from that. So, yeah. One, one thing you can see, yeah. oh, sorry, I'm going to jump in, is that, you know, he might not always play, but he works hard. He works so hard. And, it, yeah, as you said, it's so nice to see him get that goal because you feel like, oh, he deserves it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I think he, you know, he needs that, like, just that one goal. I know he, he scored against Doncaster last season. and didn't, didn't score much onwards from there. But he just, I think I think we need to stop this whole thing of keep um, keeping Calvert-Lewin playing for a couple of games and then subbing off for Beto. I think Beto needs to have a proper chance, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I I I agree. I think I think he had a very good all round performance, really. And and again, you know, as we've said, you know, I guess it's it, it's easier to to bully League Two defenders than it is to to bully Premier League defenders. But I thought his hold up play was excellent, and he was using his body a lot better. And you know, still getting fouled constantly like he always is. But I felt he was he was dealing with it better, and you know, staying on his feet and and making stuff happen still. So I thought, like, as you say, it was a really good all round all round performance. And as you say, it shows there is more to his game than just being the impact sub, which I I don't think he's really suited to. I think he's I think he is better, as you say, being in from the start and you know, uh, you know, d- like bullying defenders really because he's he's got the all the um physical traits to do that definitely. So yeah, like I say, it's it it was, I, I, I you know I could I could tell you know that Goodison was getting on the players' backs a little bit in the first half, but. I thought the second half it really started to ease a lot better once we started to play a bit better and uh, and once the scoreline was beyond any doubt and uh, yeah in, into the next round of course and as you say that will be definitely a confidence boost one going forward got the first goals on the board got the first win on the board and now we can uh, look ahead um, into the Bournemouth game but uh, yeah like I say Carabao Cup is a bit of an odd one isn't it because with the situation we've been in the last few seasons. You, you almost feel the priority still has to be on getting results in the Premier League. But, you know, last season we were almost threatening to, to you know, get into the latter stages. And it was it was only a, a bit of a hiccup at Fulham. And obviously, uh, if the penalties had gone a little bit differently, it might have been a very different story. Um, but, you know, last season at Goodison, a trophy? Who, who knows? You know, you know, stranger things have happened. Um but uh, yeah, it's um, obviously it's Southampton in the next round, another home fixture. So one more fixture at Goodison, which is um, always a positive for me. Um, but obviously there is also the controversy of the of the draw seeding and all that rubbish with the um, you know, the teams that are playing European football get prioritised and are basically it's ensured they don't play each other, so they stay in the competition longer, which uh, has obviously drawn a bit of a controversy. So. Um, yeah, what 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 you what what are you thinking? Um, go looking forward. Do we do we put a bit of focus on the Carabao Cup? Do you reckon? It, it's it's hard, isn't it? Because when you are sort of struggling on the league, all you kind of kind of think of is the league. You're just thinking, oh, we need three points. I think it was that time last season where we had Burnley in the cup in the Carabao, and it's like you beat them, beat the company, thinking, oh, we could do with those points in the league, but you know. A Car- Carbo Cup run, FA Cup run, I mean, I'll welcome it because, you know, we haven't had much success at all, have we, or anything to shout about. If we get to a semi-final, final, or whatever, you, you know, you're going to be buzzing in the final season of um, Goodison Park. So, yeah, we're in the hat for the next one. Southampton at home. It's, you know, another night game at Goodison. I mean, you've got to take it all in again because we're, we've got not many of them left, have we? So, yeah. Mm. And, uh, yeah, obviously, I think um, as it's about to go out, will probably be on deadline day. So um, mm. obviously there's, there's still quite a few things going on um, in, in the background and hopefully a few more things still to happen before um, that slams shut because you know I think the general consensus is that this squad probably still needs work if we're um, in a position to do it. But uh, yeah, as we speak, I think 
Mangala's looking pretty close in an incoming. Neil Morpé all but sees out the door based on the fact that he's, you know, posting on Twitter saying about how he's finally free and all this rubbish that, um, yeah, has, has only um, made his relationship with the Evertonians just that little bit worse if it could have possibly got that bit worse. Um, but, uh, We're fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly that, and uh, and then yeah, um, obviously you know there's still you know the possibility that someone makes a late swoop for the likes of Calvert Lewin or even Brantway, and you know um, I think I think we'll all probably be a bit relieved that all the speculation will finally be over and we can stop worrying about this just for a few months. But uh, yeah, what what were you thinking ahead of um, deadline day? Are we going to pull any surprises out the bag? <laughs> what what do we reckon? Well, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? I think one thing's for sure is that at this stage of the season, it would be stupid to sell Bramfleet, wouldn't it? Mm. Because if you're going to sell him, sell him at the start so we can replace him and strengthen the squad. So I'd be fuming if Bramfleet went. He won't go. I don't believe he will go. Um, in terms of additions, we've obviously got that Mangala. I don't really know much about him. What kind of profile player is he? I think he's quite physically strong, I'm guessing. Uh, I think he's quite similar to what we've already got. I feel like personally we need a bit of a technician in midfield. Yeah, obviously they're they're a bit harder to come by, like, but I think yeah, maybe the idea that it's someone a bit more defensive who can who could play alongside a an Iribuna or Garner to would, would would maybe be a bit allowed a bit more that freedom, or even if someone like Decore drops back doing his box to box role, someone who can just sit a bit more, a bit like how we tried to play on Arna last season, really. Um but you know, I, I guess maybe doing a bit more of the simple stuff rather than Onana trying to Play, play these balls through that our players just aren't, aren't getting onto or aren't reading or haven't got the physical capabilities to get to. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm like you, really. I don't know tons about him. Um, I think he did okay at Forest, but you know, um, at the same time, they, they, they got, they got him out the door pretty quickly. So wouldn't have really kicked on too much. Strange, I guess. Bit of a strange one. He, didn't he, didn't he sign for Leon and then go back to, um, and then he's come back on loan to us now, hasn't he? In the yeah. Same summer. It's it's one of them where I think they had him on loan last season with like a, an option or an obligation to buy. They've got him in, and uh, and and now he's being loaned out. But it's another one from Leon, and I think it's it, it's you know it's with all this John Textor stuff going on, and obviously the you know him having his ownership of Leon. I think it, it's uh, the little things going on and stuff that obviously will, will probably become a, a bit more clear down the line. Um, obviously, I think you know we've made our feelings clear about Mope, but um. Uh, obviously, you know, there's still a bit of uncertainty about uh, Calvert Lewin, and obviously the situation we've spoken on about a little bit. Do, do you think does there any any chance that he still goes? Because there's surely no time to get in a replacement now, and, and we definitely need one if he does go. Oh well, yeah, we need we need one. I mean, you could we won't be replacing his goals at the minute anyway, but we would need another body in in the door sort of thing. Um, but I, I, it's a bit. I mean, at this point. I don't think anyone's really that interested in him, are they? No one seems to really want to take a pump with him. We had Newcastle and that one kind of broke down the deal, deal, uh, deal with Minter. And there's rumours going around with Chelsea being linked to him. But why? Why I don't understand why Chelsea would go after him. I think, you know, Nicholas Jackson's doing all right there. They're going after Oss Osserman as well, aren't they? Mm. So I think I think Calvert-Lewin's more like, um, you know, insurance, just, just in case those deals don't go through. Um, it's 15 million. It's a snip to Chelsea, really, isn't it? But... It's a, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because we we could end up losing them for absolutely nothing, hmm. and you know that's a bit of a dagger to the heart sort of thing. But yeah, I I can't see him leaving. To be honest, I don't don't think there's enough interest. Yeah, and I guess I guess you could maybe say that the priority has been on making sure that we replace him, and if if they've decided that there's there's no one like suitable available that we can get in this summer, then I, I guess the argument is that keep him for another year if he's the best we've got. Um, you know, obviously we're in a situation where we can't really turn down any sort of money, but fifteen million isn't isn't a great amount. And you've got to remember that we barely paid anything to get him in in the first place. So even if he went for a free, it wouldn't be like we're making a, a massive net loss on him. And we might decide that that fifteen million we're losing out on, like if he stays this season and and has a decent year for us, that it almost makes up for that, and he gives us another year to either identify someone suitable or for someone suitable to become available next summer when, when, once he does go. So, like I say, it, it, it wasn't an ideal situation all round. I guess, you know, probably the, the ideal situation will be that he, he turns around in, say, October and just says, 
oh, right, I'll sign. I'll I'll sign on on the terms you want me or something like that. And oh, he is willing to negotiate a bit more, and, and we managed to keep him. So I guess you know we're maybe playing it with um with that in the back of our minds as well. So as you say, I'd I'd there's there's not enough time now for him to go on us to get someone in, and it would be it would be akin to suicide doing that. You'd submit he's out, um, which would just leave Beto. As, as the only available striker for for the foreseeable, so as you say, it would be mad madness, I think, to uh to sell him now. Definitely, I'd say. Um, and yeah, it so um, go on, sorry. Yeah, it, it it would it would be madness. I mean, like I said, we wouldn't necessarily be replacing his goals, but we need that extra body in, and like as you said as well. That, taking a hit on the 15 million, it could be the difference if he has an upturn in form, it could be the difference between us staying up. It could be, couldn't it? Mm. And then you see that as like a risk worth taking. Yeah. And that's, I've, I've seen people saying that, you know, oh, he, he doesn't look interested in, in his first three games. And I, I honestly don't really see it. I genuinely don't. Um, I, I think, um, you know, like the, the, the talk is that he's asking for too much money. And obviously that's not ideal. But, I don't think he's ever a player who's, who's not given his all while he's been it. I genuinely don't, um, and I think he's overcome a lot, like in in his in the last few years, to um to still be in this position where he's probably the best striker we have, um, and and I think he's he's weighed in with a lot of important goals, and and I think he contributes a lot more to our overall play than than people give him credit for, and as we said before, like obviously in an ideal world he'd, he'd get more goals, but. I I I think the the amount of work he puts in on 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 in in the other aspects of the game make him really important for us and and I think the effort is is always there for me and I think the stats have been that you know he's, he makes so many runs gets on so many balls that Pickford like pumps up for him or whatever and 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 really gives it all really so I I I don't think those accusations are fair and I think once the uncertainty is over about whether or not he's going this summer. I, th I think he'll almost be back to normal, really. And, you know, one last season at Goodison, the final season at Goodison, I do think he has a genuine affinity for the club, even if he doesn't particularly want to stay here. And I do think um, it, it could be still quite a decent season for him, really. Um, yeah, well, I think, I think in, in an ideal world, we'd create more chances for him. That's why it sometimes maybe doesn't look like he's working as hard as he is, because he's maybe not closing down like a battle does. But he's trying to conserve his energy because he brings the ball down, and brings the players into the game, doesn't he? Mm. Um, I, I do, I do, I do agree that he, he doesn't. He's not. He is working hard. It might not look like it because of like a battle, um, but yeah, I, I completely agree, agree with what you're saying. Yeah, he's 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 never been one of those type of players that can fashion chances for himself. You know, he's not that type of striker. You know, like Tarlan's not that type of striker. You know, I know it's a mad comparison, but it but it's the fact Tarlan relies on service. Um, and, you know, he's playing in a team that can get him way more service than our team can. But we saw how good calvert Loon could be when we had, you know, the likes of Digne, Richarlison, Hamas Rodriguez, who could create these quality chances for him. And, you know, suddenly he's looking towards like 20 goals a season and things like that. That's how good he can be um, with the um, with the right surface. So, yeah, like I say, I'm, I'm still fully behind him. And like I say, the situation is not ideal. But if he stays for one more season, he's still our player, still 100% behind him. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, then of course, yeah, obviously, once deadline day is over, we have another game on Saturday. Or, or it's suddenly coming thick and fast again. You know, obviously, we have the uh, international break just after that, which will halt momentum a little bit. But uh, yeah, games coming thick and fast for at the moment. Um, who do who who are we starting? Like I said, I think we mentioned earlier that I think we probably both want to see um in die involved. But um, what about the uh, the other new signings who who should get the nod? Um, is Tarkovsky fixed? I, don't, I think he's a bit of a touch and go, isn't he? Mm. Is I he... think I think it was one of them where you know he, he played on Saturday and then I think they just said we'll leave him out on Tuesday, let him regain fitness back. But I'd, I'd imagine if he was available to start last Saturday, I can't see any reason why he wouldn't be available to start against Bournemouth. Yeah, so I I, I think he'll stick with the same back four to be honest as, as Tottenham. I think he'll say uh, not the same back four. He'll stay with um, Tarkovsky and Michael Keane for centre half. Mikhailenko obviously left back. The right back, I think um, he's probably going to put Young back in again, isn't he? I think. Oh, I if, don't think um, he'll play. If Coleman's fit, 
I say Coleman played for about an hour against uh, against Doncaster. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? You never know what he's going to do in that right back position at the bit. Yeah, <laughs> but um, he got Avan Dye in there, and I think the rest of the team. It's obviously McNeil Harrison. I think he might play better up front. Irabunin and Garner again. Mm. Maybe James Garner. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because they're only just coming back into the side. Mm. I thought um, James Garner looked pretty rusty to me, I thought, on Tuesday, to be honest. I think it was maybe just get a bit of fitness in him, you know, against, against lesser opposition, really. Uh, so I'd imagine he'd, he'd probably stick on the bench. Um, no, no, no Lindstrom starting, do you reckon? No, I don't think he's quite ready yet. I think, I think uh, maybe an appearance last 20, 20, 15 minutes off the bench. Um, I don't think he looked the fittest on the, on, against Doncaster. Um, I don't think he's quite ready yet, just like Dice says. He's learning the nuts and bolts of it, as he said. <laughs> That's his new saying now, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah I think um, still needs a bit of time than Shroom, but I think I, I, I'm quite confident it'll come because he's got the technical quality, I think. And so, yeah, with all that in mind, uh, what, what do we reckon? What, what, will be, uh, what will be the score on Saturday? Um, I'm going to go for a 2 0 win to the Blues. 2 0. Hmm. I say I actually um I have quite a lot of time for Bournemouth and I think I really do like their side. I think this um you know people said that Solanke going I thought would be like a big a big hit to them and maybe it is but I think this striker they've got in is is the more than suitable replacement and I really like the side they're building like around that. So I do have a lot of time for Bournemouth but I just had the feeling now after after that you know game on Tuesday. I, I just I, I kind of had the feeling things have started to click a little bit more now. And once deadline day is over, I think that'll be a big weight off a lot of people's shoulders, you know, knowing that this this is where we are now, this is the squad, this is what we need to do. And I just had a feeling it might all click. So I'm 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 gonna go for one nil because I think our results against Bournemouth last few seasons have been pretty good as well. So um yeah, fingers crossed we can uh, get a decent result. But I am I'm, I'm still gonna bang on with what I've been saying all season. I think if we if, if Bournemouth do manage to pick us out, I I don't think it's the end of the world because I don't think Bournemouth are um as anywhere near as bad as people are making out. I I think they'll be I think they'll finish for above us this season anyway. Um and we'll be at least pushing for the top half, if not comfortably in there. So I think they're a lot of better side than people were making out and it won't be as damaging a result as as some people um might think it will be. Um, but yeah, uh, just um before we end it now, uh, we're going to be launching into our our new segment. So it's kind of a place in the uh the quiz questions that we um uh, have been doing for the first two podcasts. But uh, yeah, this is the Goodison throwback segment. So it is the um so yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a different theme each week. Um, and yeah, just a bit more looking back really. And I think you know. Some rival fans say that's what Evertonians do best, looking back and, you know, talking about how good things used to be compared to what they're like now. But, uh, you know, I think with it being the last season at Goodison, there's, there's always going to be so much of that. Um, and, you know, for all the fans, they'll be thinking back to much happier days than we will be. But um, regardless, um, you know, we've uh, we've seen better times than we have now anyway, um, than, we, than we have nowadays anyway. So, um, yeah. Uh, this one going to be focused on the very first times uh, that each of us went to um Goodison Park. So um, yeah, Max, do you want to uh, tell us all about your uh, first ever game at Goodison Park? Yeah, well, my first ever game was on my birthday, which was on the seventh of February, two thousand nine. I was seven years old. It was Everton at home, obviously Goodison Park against Bolton, and we won three 0 um, the goal scorers that day was Arteta and drummer Brazilian Joe. I do. Was it Brazilian? Yeah. I mean, he, scored, he scored two goals. It was a volley and a pen. That was the first time I ever went to Gleason Park. Mm. Um, following 11 games that I went to as well, we all won. So I had a good streak at that point. But we had the first time stepping foot into Gleason Park. So the smell, the feel of it, just seeing that stadium for the first time. Uh, as a kid, it's just the most amazing feeling in the world, especially being with your dad. Mm. Well, yeah, the the, the similarities there are, are, are mental. Like I said, there's so many things that you've picked out there that I'll I'll be echoing because um, I was the same season just a few months before. Uh, I was six, so I, I I would have turned um seven just a few months after you did. Um, but yeah, six years old, 28th of December 2008, uh, and also a three 0 win, funnily enough. Um. 
against uh, against Sunderland. Um, again, Bickel Arteta opened the scoring with a free kick. Then it was another free kick, which um, it was one of them where it hits the wall, bounces back, and then it deflected in off a defender. So I think it went down off as, as an own goal off um, one of the Sunderland defenders. And then uh, towards the end, uh, bloody Dan Gosling, remember him? Um, scores his, uh, his, yeah. first, um, his first senior Everton goal. Um, so I always kind of had a little bit of affinity with Dan Gosling for the first few um few months mm. of watching Everton because then he you know he goes on to score that winner in the derby um that memorable one so yeah so I think I I've got one of the worst first favorite Everton players ever in Dan Gosling um <laughs> uh, but yeah um he was the first player that really made a connection with me and they, exactly like you really I remember um. We did all the pre-match routines, you know. I've got photos of the um, like by the Goodison Road sign, um, and and all that, covered in hats and scarves and little badges and things like that. You know, the proper old school thing. And and I was exactly like you. I remember the smell of like yeah, like you can't even really describe it, but like if you've been, you you know what you know what that smell is of just you know of just Goodison and that. And I I it was one of them where I remember my dad was like. You know, the, the noise might be a little overwhelming for you. And like when I went to my first music concert a few years later, I was a bit like that. And the crowds was a, it was a little too overwhelming. But Goodison, it, I just had none of that. Uh, it was it felt like like home almost like straight away, like instantly. And and like I say, that feeling, as you say, of of walking out. I was I was near the bottom of the main stand. I think so. I had a great view of the pitch and yeah, just walking out. In, in into into the stand for the first time and seeing the pitch and all that it's just uh it's crazy and yeah i'm i'm obsessive over that season that first season that i was watching us and uh obviously that was the season we ended up reaching the um the fa cup final and i went to the semi-final at wembley beating united on penalties still probably the best game i've ever been to and uh yeah just amazing feelings and my dad tried to warn me that you know, it's not always going to be as good as this, like finishing fifth yeah. and reaching the FA Cup final. I didn't listen, but uh, yeah, that, that is just as good as it's got, really, isn't it? And uh, yeah, just amazing memories. Uh, such an amazing place. It is, isn't it? I remember obviously going and I, my first ever time, I don't do this every time, by the way, my first ever time was hospitality. Um, so I had a bit of a meal before. I didn't rough it like um, I normally do. And um, it was like a free course meal. I was only seven, and you don't really appreciate it at the time. All, all, I, all I was thinking about was getting in the stadium, do you know what I mean? So I was for an hour before watching the players warm up a lot. Um, yeah, the best time. David Moyes era, one of the best areas, isn't it, really? Of yeah. um, Everton, for, like, at 21, 22. So, yeah, yeah, I'll always remember with fond memories of those times. Mm. Yeah, that, as you say, I, I I was similar to you for a while. I had, had a really good streak. First few games I went to were all like comfortable wins and that. And then I remember it all coming crashing to earth when I went to the first game of the, the next season when Arsenal thumped us. I just thought, oh, I was the lucky mascot for so long. But uh, yeah, that, that didn't uh, quite remain the case for too long after that. But um, uh, yeah, um, as I say, uh, definitely um, happier times. But uh Hopefully, um, you know, for the for the younger generation, those those kids who will be, you know, there will be some that will be going to their first game like this season and in the final season at Goodison Park, and their dads will be making sure that they they still get to see Goodison Park. And you know, I I really empathise with those kids who will never get to experience it and and will only know Bramley more. Just I just can't imagine that. But uh, yeah, like I say, so that like said, there's going to be a lot of this um throughout the season, and uh, like I say, we'll be dedicating the end of this podcast to um looking back um on our memories of Everton and Goodison Park. But uh yeah, I think that pretty much sums this one up. So uh thank you very much for joining me, Max, and uh talking all things Everton as ever. Um please leave a like if you enjoyed the video, uh subscribe to the Toffee Blues channel for more Everton content, including this podcast, which we are sticking with weekly at the moment. Hopefully we'll manage to keep that up for the uh, foreseeable. And uh, yeah, we will see you in the next video of the Toffees.